Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Department of Energy Python Exchange. My name is Cameron Riddell, and I will be your host this evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on the time zone that you live in. As you all may know, our goal here is to have Python thrive within the National Labs system and associated research sites. In support of that goal, we are joined today by Eric Roberts, who is a computer project scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and will be sharing with us today on DLSIA, or Deep Learning for Scientific Image Analysis. Eric creates new deep learning tools, often building end-to-end -end frameworks and PyTorch level leverage solutions for many challenging image analysis tasks across many fields. But before we get into the agenda and introduce our panelists today, I want to remind everyone of a few key points about these exchanges. This call will be recorded, edited, and posted online. As a consequence, please be conscious of the information in the questions that you may ask to ensure that you're not accidentally sharing anything that's privileged or requires clearance. Additionally, as you all know, we are a growing community and we would love to stay in touch with each of you. If you'd like to be kept up to date with our monthly exchanges, please sign up for our mailing list, which you can find on our website, meetup.dlepy.org. You can additionally find recordings of all of our past exchanges on this site, as well as a recording of today's exchange once it has been edited and uploaded. For those of you who have never joined us before for an exchange, I would like to share with you that these events are typically broken down into four parts. First, We'll introduce our fantastic lineup of hosts and guest panelists so that you may all get to know them as well as their respective fields and background. Second, we'll kick off into a coding activity where we'll ask some very applied questions to our panelists to elicit some practical discussion about best practices in software development and where they fit into the world of academic and scientific research. Third, We'll turn things over to our guest panelist, Eric, who will share some prepared remarks on Python and how it fits into his work, his research, and how he eases the lives of other researchers like ourselves. Then, to wrap up, we'll have a full discussion about the points brought up by our guest panelists. And for everyone joining us in the audience, this is your chance to ask questions and engage with our panel to help us all understand where Python fits into the life of a researcher. So I will go ahead and start by sharing my screen and we can go ahead and get to know our panelists. Of course, you can always find all of the materials for these exchanges on our website. That's meetup.doepy.org. And let's dive right in to our host panelists. This is me. Hello everyone, my name is Cameron Riddell. And while I don't have an affiliation necessarily with a specific lab, I do have a background in academic research as I have studied cognitive sciences in graduate school and even before. For today's exchange, I would love to discuss any and all questions relating to Python as a whole or specific concepts and uses in Python's vast scientific computing ecosystem relating to tools such as NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. Next up, we have James Powell. James, I see you're affiliated with NumFocus, but what is it that you're an expert in and what would you love to talk about today? Hi, everybody. My name is James Powell, and as you can see from the slide, I serve as the chairman of the NumFocus Board of Directors, where NumFocus is the 501c3 nonprofit that fiscally sponsors many of the tools that we use in our everyday work, tools like Jupyter, NumPy, Pandas. If you're interested in getting more involved in the open source community, in the development of these projects, or the building of community around them, I'd love to answer questions related to that. If you have a project and you're curious, can I make my project one of the seminal projects like NumPy or Scikit-Learn? I want to build a community around the development of this project. I'd love to answer questions there as well. And of course, I do work together with Cameron uh, delivering things like training services to the national labs. And so if you're interested in questions like, how do I get my scientists not only to learn how to use these tools better, but to want to learn how to use these tools better? Well, I'd love to also answer questions like that for all of you. Thank you very much, James. I know we'll have a lot of Python specific questions for you today, as well as the tooling around it. Moving on, we have 
Dan Allen. Dan, I see you are from BNL, but what is it that you do? What do you consider yourself an expert in, Dan? Well, I've spent a lot of time trying to build ground up communities across the DOE labs and our international peers, figuring out how to share parts of the code that are the same and leave room for people to specialize and differentiate themselves in, uh, in the areas where they're innovating their science. That's absolutely wonderful. I don't think much research would get done without support from people like yourself, Dan. It seems like you, you run a lot of behind the scenes things here and we, I know that everyone really appreciates your effort. Moving on to our next host panelist, we are also joined by Tani Chavez. Tani, I see you are from LBNL, just like Eric, but Tani, what do you consider yourself an expert in and what would you love to talk about today? Um, sure. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Tani Chavez, and I am a computational research scientist at the ALS Computing Group at LBNL. Uh, ultimately, my major is uh, very focused on machine learning, and that's uh, most of the research that I performed during my PhD studies. Uh, currently, I think that's something that I would love to discuss is how to make machine learning algorithms or concepts just more accessible to a general scientific community. Um, so I would just love to talk more about that. Fantastic, and I'm super glad that you are here because Eric is, of course, going to be talking about a lot of machine learning. And Tani, you're, I know you'll have some great questions for him today. Next up, we are joined by our guest panelist, Eric Roberts. Eric, you are also just like Tani from LBNL, but what is it that you specifically do and what would you love to talk about today? Ah, uh, so what do I do? Well, first off, thanks everyone for putting this a uh, wonderful presentation, everything on, um, everyone being so accommodating. Um, myself, I'm a computation, I'm a computer project scientist over at uh, LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I focus mainly on machine learning tools, synthesizing a lot of existing machine learning tools and making them accessible um, and sort of easy to use um, for just a bevy of different scientists, human line scientists, um, researchers in biology. Um, across many different fields. Um, and I think, yeah, piggybacking, up, piggybacking off um, what Tanya just said, I think making things more accessible, making these machine learning tools and, and efforts we do more accessible and flexible, I think, for, for many different types of researchers from all different types of background. And that's what I'll be sort of focusing on today, software packages we've developed and the tools we've gotten out to people. and. Um, the tools we've uh, sort of applied to ourselves on many different <laughs> applications and images. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say today. I know it is such an intense thing to start even just starting your PhD or continuing research and needing to be a leading expert in your field, whatever that may be, and then also be tasked with, well, now I have this insane amount of data that I need to process and make sense of, and all of a sudden you're asking me, an academic researcher, to become an expert in computer programming? I, how do I not need to worry about you know, working against the tool and instead do my research? And it's people like you creating very easy to use tools with flexible parameters that enable research to get done by other scientists. So thank you very much for your work. I'm very excited to hear what you have in store for us today. Before we wrap up our introductions, I do want to invite everyone in our audience to become a host panelist. All you need to do is reach out to us via email. You can find our email on our website, that's meetup.doepy.org. We would love to get to know each and every one of you a little bit more, and I would love to see you up here asking questions and interacting with us live during our monthly exchanges. Next up on our agenda, I would love to invite James up on stage so that we can get started with the coding activity. James, I hear that you have a very fun one planned for us today. A lot of seminal technologies were created at the national labs, technologies that have changed the course of human progress. Yes, they were invented here. Well, today in our coding activity, we're gonna be talking about that question that must have been lurking in the back of the minds of the people who created these technologies, should I really go and invent my own dot, dot, dot? I'll share with you the rules. 
we have put together five rounds plus a bonus round talking broadly about different types of technologies that you might come across in your research work. And each time you might ask yourself, should I invent my own version of this? Should I build something on top of it? Or should I just use the tool off the shelf as it exists and just come to terms with whatever limitations it might have? I'll try and fit my use case into that. Because it's a big ask to say, you know, you need to invent your own brand new version of something if there is already a community. We'll ask our panelists to comment on whether or not you should go ahead and try and build your own tool, whether or not you should just go ahead and use whatever already exists, or whether there might be some middle ground where maybe you build a library on top of an existing tool or some other approaches you might have to adapting the existing tools without building something entirely yourself. Why don't we get started and jump right into the very first round. Data formats. You need to use some data format, JSON, XML, NetCDF, or something more specific, but it turns out the, the data format that you're looking at, it's too limiting for your use case. It doesn't handle this one corner case, doesn't handle that corner case. Should you invent your own data format for storing or sharing scientific data, or should you just come to terms with the ones that exist and the limitations therein? I probably have the strongest opinions and the most pain on this one, so I'll jump in. Uh, I want to pull apart format, like what you've listed, and then the layout of what you put inside it, like the choice of the names. Most formats are kind of containers, especially popular ones in science, like HDF5, that you put different kinds of keys in there. Sometimes it's okay to invent your own layout and your own names, because dealing with standards and finding one that's appropriate can take a lot of time, and maybe there isn't one. But you should at least use a format that someone else can open, a basic format, that, that whether or not someone can understand what's in it, they can at least, you might say, parse it or open it in a program. I will now step so, off my soapbox. So I think that's a great piece of advice, Dan. Here, I have a follow-up question for you. Mm. What about cases like the original versions of the open document format that Microsoft had, where it was XML with just one tag and then a giant binary blob? Is that more or less just kind of inventing your own thing, or does that still count as choosing an open and fair container but doing what you want inside. Yeah, I never really knew the details of how those old formats work. I remember I remember dealing with them in the transition. Yeah, I guess I guess it's a judgment call, but when you use one of these formats, you should try to make a document that kind of looks like other documents in that format because at the end of the day, you're trying not to surprise or confuse the person who's opening it, who might be a collaborator or your successor in your lab or future you. I think that is ultimately the goal, and whatever strategy you use to achieve that goal is fine. I'd like to take maybe one more comment from one of our panelists about whether or not you should reinvent your data formats or just go with the flow, just deal with what is already standard for your field. Um, I think uh, it's also good to take into consideration as well um, where this data format is going to live and what services are going to be interacting with it. Uh, because I would probably say if this is for like an internal process that is going to be handled only and exclusively within a control environment that we are putting together, or probably say perhaps really like if there is nothing out there that accommodates what you need, then looking into a new data format that is exclusively for this environment, that that will be viable. Uh, but if this is something that was mentioned before by Dan, like something that is going to be shared with someone else, that is going to be like across different national laboratories or divisions, it probably wouldn't make much sense for that to happen. So I'll probably say it also depends on the environment and where this data uh, is going to be accessed upon. Fantastic. That is some additional color. Thank you so much for that, Tani. Why don't we move on to our second round? This is something that some national labs really do like doing. The general purpose programming language that's out there, MATLAB or Python or R, it's too limiting for my use case. Should I just create my own special purpose language for just what I want to do? And I know that we have a couple of folks from Livermore on this call right now, and I know some of them have almost certainly had conversations about tools like Yorick or similar. Do you create your own programming language or do you just live with the ones that exist?
James, I'm going to go ahead and say do the best you can with what's already out there and what's standard because even if you distribute your favorite, your brand new programming language to you, all of your colleagues, all of your closest friends, that does preclude anybody else from actually replicating your results unless they have access to the specific version of your programming language and all of the specific maybe dependencies that that has. And when designing your own programming language, unless you're thinking about those and an expert in those off the get go, you might be having some serious issues trying to get everybody else in the world up to speed with your very niche programming language that you've used to perform some analysis. And then it ends up being the case where you have all of these codes that you've written over 50 years in maybe a tool like Yorick, and perhaps the main developer is no longer actively developing that tool. And then you have to figure out, what am I going to do with all of those? Hmm. I've translated some Yorick code. <laughs> and how did, how did that go, Dan? Was that a case where you could see the reasoning for why they might have created it originally? but maybe if tools like Python existed at the time, you would have chosen that. What's your view on the, the genesis of the creation of tools like Yorick? I think that's pretty fair. I think maybe the space of languages for science has annealed more in 2023 than it had 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I hesitate to ask, does anybody want to talk about tools like Epics as part of this? No. <laughs> okay, no, no, no comments on ethics. We can see there's all, often some some sore spots here. Any other comments on this round, or shall we move on? Why don't we move on to our next round? Here, this one is a little bit more specific. Many of the labs we know are looking into tools for, especially if they're user facilities, tools to present either dashboards or frameworks for their end users. And they may already be using tools like React or PyQt in order to present results to a user who wants to be able to click buttons. But they might find out along the way that the dashboarding frameworks or the web frameworks or even the visualization tools are insufficient for their particular use cases. Are there any circumstances where it makes sense for you to invent your own dashboarding framework or your own web framework? And by the way, if there are, you won't be the first because as we know, these are, these are proliferated. There's so many choices out there already. can go ahead and kick us um, off. Oh, yeah, Tani, please. Oh, okay. of course. Like, um, yeah, I think as someone um, that has uh, experienced this up to some extent, um, because it is true, sometimes uh, some few things don't come just like ready out of the box to be implemented, especially when handling um, very complex data sets as the ones that we usually have to uh, work with, you know, as part of the national laboratory system. Um, in those cases, though, um, I don't think we have reached that point yet where we have said we have to create our own framework. Instead of that, uh, we're trying to use, still use those tools, but more so kind of like on a very um, um, kind of like building new components within still this environment. So, for example, in this case, something that we use uh, quite a bit uh, in our research group is Dash. Dash is basically Plotly, a little bit of uh, believe in React in the, in the background. Um, and um, we're still trying to use that framework. It's just that we are creating or trying to um, just uh, create our own custom components based on that so that we can move forward. Uh, but that's kind of like the, the approach we have taken so far, because I do believe that uh, it, it will be a lot of effort uh, to put together like uh, the, the land, like the, the groundwork for a web-based framework. So it's better just to build up upon uh, what already exists. Uh, of course, that has been our use case in particular. I would love to hear about uh, probably someone else's experience on this. I'm curious, Tani, when you hit a brick wall where something simply cannot be done in Dash, what do you do? Do you just advise people to say, maybe we don't do that? Or do you have some other approach for dealing with the impossible? Uh, right, no, I think at this point we have actually uh, hit that point, and what we're doing right now, it's reaching to the experts. So we're actually reaching to Dash, trying to build some collaborations around um, to see what we can do and how can can we accommodate some few other things. Uh, another option will be as well to use uh, another framework that is probably not based on Dash, but something different, and just trying to mix. Since everything is web browse friendly, then at the end of the day, the user experience won't change. 
um, it's just that it's going to be powered by different technologies. Um, so that's something I think that we're interested in moving forward in order to um, pass through some of the challenges we have experienced so far. And since there's so many choices out there, Tanning, it sounds like you feel like you can always move to another choice that might satisfy your use cases. Let's hear from Cameron, and then we'll move on to our next round. Yeah, I think talking about all these different dashboarding frameworks, there's, I mean, we've listed React and Panel, but there's probably at least six or seven other just based in Python, excluding React. And I think one of the things that I always look for when adopting a new tool is not the neatest one-liner of getting up and running, but it's the flexibility that that tool lets me achieve. If I'm looking into something like a dashboarding tool, there better be a very convenient and easy way for me to write probably JavaScript against that dashboarding tool so I can create and customize my own kind of web components. If it doesn't have that capability, I'm guaranteed to run into that brick wall at some point. And the second thing I wanted to say was, when encountering a new tool and hitting that brick wall, you should solve it as surgically or precise as possible. If you're running into issues, maybe transporting data from a back end to a front end because maybe the volume is too large, you shouldn't be looking to replace the framework. You should be looking to implement maybe your own custom serialization such that you can uh, better transport that volume of data from one end to the other. Fantastic commentary. So far, I haven't heard anybody enthusiastically say, build everything from scratch, but we've heard some very nice diplomatic deliberation on this question. Why don't we move on to our next penultimate round? This one is about machine learning models. We have a lot of packages which come with a lot of machine learning models off the shelf. All you have to do is supply your data, fit, and then you can make predictions. But those models may not work for your use case. You may have something that doesn't quite fit that model. Under what circumstances should you create your own models or create your own libraries containing models as opposed to just using the off-the-shelf models that are already provided to you in tools like Scikit-Learn? And I'd love to hear from Eric, uh, since he is, of course, our machine learning expert here, and his thoughts. That is such a, that is such a varied question. The answer is going to vary from, I think, application to application, right? I mean, um, Kind of getting our hands dirty if you can use any type of pre-trained sort of classifier for the first half of your network pre-trained backbone you're most likely given a leg up um expediting the training process um but I, I personally do work with a lot of teams where, where we do need to build a lot of end-to-end -end workflows instantiate our own um our own networks obviously which tools do we use scikit learn um who's got a friendly high torch api um, we like to think we could compete with the software packages we're uh, producing out of camera, out of LBNL. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to find the right balance of, of finding networks that are not hard coded, right? Because so many, so many GitHub repos are just so hard coded into whatever data they're working on. Um, so it's, it's really hard, hard to find that consideration. The familiarity that the staff have with the machine learning topics themselves, for example, if they're new to machine learning. Maybe they should use off-the-shelf models for the first couple of research, you know, pieces of research work they do. But as they become more familiar, then they gain some freedom. Or is it the case where, you know, you feel like you can pick up the model development quickly enough that you can jump into custom models immediately? I, I don't know. I, I've got my own biases here. I learned by just sort of doing, making my own right from the scratch, right from the get-go. But I think it's going to depend on someone's uh, sort of learning process, right? If you're just getting into this realm, I think you've got the best of both worlds. Do you learn best from seeing whatever examples are out there? You can pick whatever off-the-shelf model you want, whatever toy data you want. Um, you learn best by um, developing your own tools. There's a lot of tools out there. Sorry to give you an answer that kind of best of both worlds catch all, but um, there's just so much out there that's going to fit your needs and how you particularly learn and particularly what your lab specifically needs. I'm, I'm curious to hear from one of our panelists, is there any consideration to the simplicity and explainability that you get from using an off-the-shelf model as opposed to creating some crazy contorted ensemble of different approaches? I wonder if I can hop off of a different point, actually. Eric said something that I really want to, I really want to build on, uh, the idea of, Building something yourself is a really good way to understand the problem. 
And I think that may be the strongest argument for answering yes to any of the questions we've heard so far, your own language, your own machine learning model, your own dashboarding framework, your own format. Sometimes it's much easier to evaluate the offerings if you can more deeply understand the design trade-offs. You try to build it and suddenly you, you look at another design and you say, that's why they did it that way. But maybe the crucial step is to make sure to take your own thing and throw it away <laughs> and not to, not to fall too in love with it or at least strongly challenge the idea that what you're building is actually the solution and not a, a learning experience and an investment on its own. Um, Fantastic. Does anyone want to respond to James' question? I don't do much with models. If, if not, why don't we move on? The last two rounds are maybe a little bit provocative. They are structured around perhaps getting a specific response from our panels who have some direct experience with this. A scientist comes to you and says, well, the industry standard security framework and approaches, they're too limiting for my use case. Let's come up with our own approach to ensuring cybersecurity around the work that we do. And besides, maybe we're a, we're a scientific research lab, not a, not a security lab itself. And so maybe we don't need to be as heavyweight about our security approaches. Did I invent my own approaches to solving all of these cybersecurity problems, securing my data, securing access to this data? Or should I just use the off-the-shelf industry standard approaches? James, I am no cybersecurity expert by any means, but everything that I have heard from cybersecurity experts is, if you don't know what you're doing, don't try and invent it and put it into production. Speaking to Dan's previous point, I think you can definitely play around with security, uh, security frameworks if you want to, you know, just play around and dabble. But if it comes to actually securing, especially government uh, computers or government networks, you should leave that to the experts because unlike working with fun web frameworks or uh, machine learning models, there is a high risk that if something goes wrong, it's not gonna be like, oh, my model didn't work. It's going to <laughs> have very negative consequences to say the very least. And I understand some of our panelists even have experience going through audits of software that they have written, which has some security implications. And I'd love to hear if anybody wants to comment on how do you make sure that those audits are as smooth as possible? How do you make sure that maybe you don't get caught up along the way with something strange that gets flagged as being potentially insecure? Hmm. If you're alluding to me, I'll let you know because something's ongoing as we speak. I have a, a logs up in another tab watching uh, watching things proceed. But I think I would say this is, as, as, uh, as has been said, the area to be the most boring and the most standard as we possibly can. Even the experts try not to be creative in this area and uh, probably best way that I have found to work on this is to study other good projects that are trusted and used by uh, by the people who you want to be your users and you know read as much as you can and and, and pattern what you're doing on uh, you know on those successful examples is that what you're getting at James I think so and I think also that maybe contrary to your previous advice maybe don't try something yourself just to learn the field maybe try and keep it as boring as possible, as non-bespoke, as standard as possible. Yeah. Why don't we now move on to our final bonus round? And again, this is a somewhat provocative topic here. I would love to invite one of our part-time host panelists to see their advice. <laughs> Somebody says the visualization tools that I've been given, Matplotlib, Altair, Bokeh, they're too limiting for my use case. Could I create yet another visualization library. You know, you'll join, you're in good company. Enough of these have been created so far. And how might you decide whether or not you might want to do this? I would say, James, to kick us off here, you don't really need to create your own visualization library for much nowadays. If you're trying to create a static two-dimensional or even an interactive two-dimensional uh, visualization, if you can't do it in Matplotlib, I would be very surprised. 
And if you're trying to do something in three dimensions or make it highly interactive, just kind of right out of the box, there are other great tools that you have access to. We've had guest panelists previously from the Napari project that, do, that does just that. And so, as you mentioned, there are already tons of visualization tools out there, and I would encourage you to explore the ones that best fit the needs for the types of data that you often work with. And at the very end of that long road, if none of them actually do the thing that you wanted to do, I would try designing something within one of those first. If you do find a need to create your own visualization tool, I think you should be prepared to go down a very long rabbit hole of possibilities and how things are actually drawn on a computer before you get to that high level interface that you always desired or always wanted. How about inventing something on top of an existing tool? Is it the case that you should try and keep the depth as small as short as possible? For example, there's Seaborn on top of Matplotlib. Should you build things on top of Seaborn or should you always try and build them down on top of the base most layer? I would say to always try and build things on top of the base most layer. That will give your end user the most flexibility uh, in, in what they can do with your visualizations. And so you have kind of these, these concepts that you might use in one visualization toolkit that you don't want to completely abstract over. You always want those kinds of escape hatches so that people can go back down. So if they're using your tool and they need to tweak one thing and you haven't made a nice convenient function for them, they can go in and do that. This is kind of along the same lines of when I told you I was looking for web frameworks. The first one that I looked at, I wanted to make sure I could still write some JavaScript in case I had to do something very odd and very specific that the framework, the larger framework, didn't let me do. Now, I would, of course, love to hear some final comments from our colleague Tom Caswell, but this might be a little bit too provocative for him, so we'll give him an opportunity to chime in or to maybe leave the final decision for whether or not you want to build your own version of any of these tools yourself. Well, with that said, why don't we close up our coding activity for this session? Of course, the decision for whether you build it yourself or make use of something that already exists is sometimes one that requires some deliberation, maybe some debate, maybe even some provocative back and forth. But whatever the case may be, do know that if you choose to develop these tools yourself, on top of the open source scientific computing tools that we're all here to support, well, you have this community here to get further advice from and any additional support in terms of, well, how do I solve this problem here? Or how do I find people who can collaborate together with me in order to take this tool to the next level? Whatever the case may be, thank you all for joining us for this coding activity, and I'll see you all next month for our next coding activity. Thank you so much, James. These coding activities are so much fun and I love the discussions that they help drive because I think it uh, dials in on some very interesting points about if I'm doing research, how much code should I write and when do I actually need to consider writing a lot of code? Moving on to the next thing in our agenda, I would love to have Eric go ahead and share his screen to share his thoughts on a lot of the uh, machine learning work that he does. And so Eric, I would love to invite you up and the reins are yours. So again, thank you to the panelists, everyone. I'm really excited for this opportunity um, to talk about the software package. Um, I've helped develop uh, DELSIA, D-L-S-I-A, the Deep Learning for Scientific Image Analysis package. Um, I am a computer project scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and I've been working with uh, Peter Zwart for a couple of years. I was a postdoc for three, moved to scientists uh, this past year. Peter and I have been working together about two and a half years. We both fully, I was a topological fluids background. Peter was a computational chemistry background. We both um, <laughs> merged and completely dove into machine learning uh, together. Um, so within the applied math division, camera and LBL, Peter and I focus our time synthesizing machine learning tools for a variety of image analysis tasks, and we make uh, many end-to-end -end, uh, pipelines and workflows across many scientists. Um, we've worked with researchers and scientists in X-ray scattering, um, working with tomography data, working with um, a number of microscopy modalities, SA, SEM, um, focused ion beam, scattering electron microscopy, um, lattice light sheet microscopy, um, 
that's really going to be the focus today, at least uh, on the second half of the talk, um, talking about the variety of applications and collaborations Peter and I have worked on, and sort of the tool allowing us to integrate ourselves has been our software package, Delphia. Um, Peter and I, on the research and development side of things, we do develop new machine learning tools that leverage sparsity and stochasticity in our networks to help combat explosions of data. But I'll have a slide or two on a few of those methods. Uh, but again, the focus will be on applications and how we've um, leveraged the software package and what the software package offers. So let me cue the introductory um, introduction slide. Um, our scientific image analysis in the Zwart lab. Um, so machine learning really has become an indispensable tool in many, many facets of biology, x-ray scattering across many sciences, right? If the applications are limited, benign, malignant um, cell tumor classifications, determining scattering geometries for the beamline scientists, uh, for any real um, types of images, quick outlier detection you see on the right, um, with this fluctuation scattering data on the right. Um, our focus is really on full image and volume analysis using convolutional neural networks. In particular, we look at dense pixel by pixel predictions. So looking at full images, arrays of full images, we work on denoising, segmentation, classification, gap filling or infilling, I'll have a pretty cool slide on that. Um, and we look at a lot of multi-network aggregation for uncertainty quantification, where neural networks can be very confident, even if they're wrong. Uh, so we like to look at many different networks and aggregation techniques for getting confidence in our, in our network predictions. And why use neural networks? The first and foremost I always come to is fast inference once you have a trained network. When you're talking about millions of images, we can really combat the explosion of data generation and data curation when you have a trained network that accomplishes a task pretty fast. Um, and of course, there's structure that can be invisible to the human eye that can be detected. And neural networks are shown to work under severe data constraints of a slide, particularly uh, with a cool application with, well, <laughs> limited data, limited ground truth data. So, the second introductory here, I want to go over just a minute deep learning in a nutshell, quick nutshell. Um, deep learning neural networks uh, with greater than typically three hidden layers, I really think of them being an applied mathematician background as a functional approximation from inputs to outputs. Really, we have information flowing to the right in the diagram on the right. Uh, the input image is passed through the network. Um, the network is full of many different, millions of different weights that can be tweaked, that can be relearned. It's basically a massive linear algebra. The network will output something, and that network output is then, is then scored against the ground truth data, and there's an optimization process that will adjust the weights accordingly. This, as I've described, is supervised learning. It approximates a mapping by predicting against known or ground truth data. That's been the focus of our work. Uh, we're exploring different techniques for unsupervised data that discovers inherent structure of unlabeled data. You don't have the ground truth data, so it's more exploratory. Uh, but really the focus of today is going to be on supervised learning techniques with known ground truth data. And of the two main libraries, people tend to sort of gravitate towards TensorFlow and PyTorch. We, we chose PyTorch. We have a lot more flexibility, a lot more uh, networks at our fingertips, we can we can dive in and, and change, we have an easier time changing and customizing networks. Um, so on to the Delcia deep learning for scientific image analysis software package that Peter and I have developed. We really focused on easy and flexible deployment of custom neural networks in the PyTorch framework. We've got a variety of different classic networks, um, like the autoencoders from 2014, 2015, 2016, when they picked up, very useful for image compression. Uh, they're fed through and bottlenecked, and they learn this, this lower dimensional um, representation of images. It's very much a nonlinear PCA. Uh, next, we have UNETs, uh, came out in 28, uh, 2016, very popular. We created what we found is, we think is the first tunable UNET, it lets you tune and tweak all different network 
hyperparameters that govern the architecture. How wide, how deep is the network, how many filters are you using, so on and so forth. Next, we really, this is how this endeavor really got started two years ago, making a PyTorch implementation of mixed scale dense nets. Red, I wanted to really highlight these because these were really, really cool, really new network architecture out of camera. Uh, the camera had uh, Jamie Sethian and Daniel Pelt um, that focus on dense interconnectivity of all network layers. Every network layer connected forward and backward to each other. And these can really, these can really um, be fruitful when you amount of training data is low. And lastly, Peter and I working on our own version of the mixed scale dense nets where we sparsify the heck out of it and randomize connections. We make very lean networks that can aid in uncertainty quantifications. And Delcia is pretty exciting. It's, it's um, being integrated. It's integrated into the ALS led ML exchange shared platform. It's being spearheaded by Alex Hexmer and our own Tani Chavez here. Really excited we could uh, bring Delcia to the group and help users instantiate <laughs> networks of their liking and again, get it across to the masses. I've uh, wanted to take um, one slide to talk about these really cool networks, mixed scale dense networks. I'm not gonna get into too many of the details here. I wanna keep it high level. But these are leaner networks from, again, Pelt and Sethian from camera that rely on interconnectivity and dilated convolutions. So on the bottom left, you see a three layer MSD net. Uh, each of the colored layers is a convolutional filter uh, that, that houses the parameters that get tweaked. Convolutional filters are really what, what pick up on the different uh, building blocks of your images. And each layer accepts all previous convolutional channels. This is actually a relatively simple architecture uh, that makes it much easier to train, apply, and adapt uh, to many different types of problems. You can just use the same architecture for a bevy of different problems it's shown. Um, and on the right, one of the key things with these networks is dilated convolutions on the right or inflated convolutions are used to capture features at different length scales. This is juxtaposed to classic convolutional neural network um, architectures that use max pulling that lowers the resolution. You have the resolution um, and that's how classically you've explored different uh, length scales. But um, we'll be talking a little bit at length, um, specific applications we've employed mixed scale dense nets for. So moving on to the Delcia software suite, um, I would like to just highlight, I've put particularly myself a lot of work into documentation and making robust tutorials. You can find them in the GitHub linked here. You can find them in the read the docs page linked here. I'll be sure to put these links in the chat and they'll be repeated again at the final slide. So don't worry if you don't find this yet. Um, but a lot of, uh, actually a lot of development for myself as a learning development skills. Um, well, sorry, I guess web developing skills a little bit. Well, the front end stuff's been really, really helpful to learn. But jumping into the Delcia software suite specifically, Let's show a few examples on how to build or instantiate, let's say a three layer MSD network pictured on the right, where we have added activation and normalization layers. The code block uh, lines one through 16 is, uh, shows the, I think the relatively simple, the simple API used that Delcia uses to instantiate these networks. You can specify your activation function. This, this is introducing non-linearity uh, to your network, um, which, massively Im improves the representation, representative power, predictive power of these networks. You can specify your normalization layer, which is used to expedite the training process, smooth over the training process, um, really just kind of scaling your variables in, in a sort of mathematical sense. Um, and you can even specify your final layers once the network is built to, to uh, morph and form whatever output you really want to use. And say you want to work with 3D voluminous images, all you need to do in red is specify you're using the three-dimensional convolutional uh, kernel, not a three by three matrix, but now a three by three by three tensor. Um, and the last uh, sort of 
tool we can go over. I, I want to specify, let's build a standard tunable unit uh, using the Delcia software suite. Um, as a user using Delcia, you're allowed a flexible approach, um, allowing the user to instantiate a network with really any type of architecture governing parameters of your choosing. On the left, uh, you see we can choose the number of layers. Uh, here, this unit is set to five layers. You can set the number of base channels. These are the number of convolutional filters, again, that are picking up on the different uh, details um, and the different building blocks of, of your images that are put together later on in the network. Um, you can specify the interlayer growth and also the intralayer growth if you want to expand or contract within layers you wouldn't want to contract. That's you, you really want to avoid bottlenecks when you're talking about a non-auto encoder network. Really overall, um, our goal is to allow easy control over the number of parameters in the network. And this is so important since architecture tuning is so essential for all applications. Um, one network that works with one application, a different network entirely will be required for a, another application. So application dependent. So we really give you the freedom to toy around and, and explore a lot of the hyperparameter spaces and find what works best for your applications. So next, I want to get to the fun stuff. I want to walk through several deep learning applications and tasks we've accomplished with the help of Delcia. This is going to be a lot of projects Peter and I have worked on, published on, um, and really, this of course is an advertisement of Delcia. This is also an advertisement. If you like what we do, um, come talk to us. If any of these applications you see kind of hit what you're wanting to do, what you're hoping to do with your big data problems, um, come talk to me. Come talk to us. We'll have contacts in the end here. But the first application we sort of toyed around with was this denoising in three dimensions with poop the data, uh, really just peaks, um, just three dimensional spherical peaks. Um, we used Supervised learning uh, with known ground truth data, removing the Gaussian noise we added in volumes of particles. On the bottom left, you see just a slice of one of the example images, target ground truth and the high levels of Gaussian noise to really lower our peak signal to noise ratio. Um, so the mixed scale dense net uh, output here was scored against the ground truth data. This again calls back to the first, uh, second slide I showed, where on the right side you see input data is fed through the network, and then the target ground truth is scored against the output from the network. Uh, this is, of course, an iterative process. Um, you optimize each each run through, and you just hopefully get better and better results. You want to see, hopefully, see robust convergence and, and, and good results, but. This favored, um, this compared favorably, this toy problem to another work um, for discerning fluorescently labeled uh, clathrin from, from noise cells. Um, but not just denoising, segmentation is, I think, sort of the most prevalent application I've seen for machine learning, actually segmenting background from foreground, segmenting this is a tree, that's a person, that's a car. That's the sky, that's a cloud. Um, so this application really looked at performance under severe data constraints. So given 3D adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscopy data, um, you see on the, on the bottom left, um, this was data from um, Berkeley professor Gokul at the Advanced Bioimaging Center. Um, if you're not familiar with the name, he was part of the Nobel Prize winning lab in 2014 under Eric Betzig. Uh, the challenge here was to label sparsely. Well, tuning back, ground truth labels were limited. I don't understand, but we had no ground truth labels. What we did, our solution was to sparsely hand draw labels using the Napari image viewer. You see the GUI, very intuitive. I recommend Napari if you ever uh, dabble and label and, and view things in 3D. Um, so our solution was to sparsely hand draw labels, and this is where the MSD nets excelled. Uh, the networks that were that were out of camera, they excelled when training data was limited. Again, that dense interconnectivity among layers promotes maximum reusability of data. 
Uh, so down to specifics, we partially annotated seven of the 385 slices. Uh, training time took two hours. We fiddled with a few different networks, but a network was trained and converged to our liking in two hours. Inference on the full stack um, took three minutes. Um, each of these well over a million pixel images. Um, you see the, the images kind of collated on the, on the bottom right here. We had some advantages, some disadvantage over there, established computer vision, computer vision methods. Um, we are not too good at, we, we don't quite separate as well as they do, but we get the overall shapes and we have many, many fewer false positives. Classic computer vision here. Um, pardon my voice, I've been getting over a cough. I feel my voice is getting worse. I'll do my best to try to stay, stay vocal here, but um, I think another 10 minutes I can push through it. So the second segmentation application is multi-class labeling in cell volumes. This is a collaboration with the Vignesh Lab over at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. The data are 3D stacks of cell nucleolus and surrounding areas. Uh, you can see the two-dimensional training slices on the right. We trained in 2D. We trained individual slices in 2D. Um, and this was from FibSem data focused ion beam. Um, Scanning electron microscopy data. It takes uh, months to collect this really uh, fine grained data they have in the lab. The objective was to classify the following pixels, the nucleolus in gold or yellow, chromosomes in blue, and the synaptonomial complexes in purple. Now the challenge here was the SC pixels in purple synaptomial complex were difficult to determine by intensity alone. You can see the zoomed in portion on the right. Um, it very contrast driven here. The model really needs to learn the image context, context being that the SC pixels are typically mostly encapsulated by the chromosomes in blue. So we curated a small training set of labels, uh, myself and a graduate student in the lab, I directed, um, just labeled a whole bunch of, a uh, whole bunch of data. We have the macro F1 scores. If you're not familiar with the F1 score, it's a favorite metric of mine for imaging the, um, analyzing the differences between images, the harmonic mean of precision and recall. We have some scores that our collaborators are, are very happy with. And I should have shown this earlier, actually, here are some results, a uh, little GIF I made. Um, Part of the sort of stuttering, the, the layered of the images, it looked really choppy. This was just an artifact from, we, we had the center sort of misaligned. Um, so they, the, the real results didn't look quite as choppy here, but I think the big improvement, the, the big thing we added to this, brought to this group was they, they really sat on this data for two years due to computation challenges. And training time took about 24 hours or trying out a, uh, several handfuls of different network architectures, specifically with the units. And once we have a train network inference time, it took about 10 minutes for millions of these, well, I think there's tens of thousands of some of these images in each uh, nucleolus stack or, or cell stack, nucleus stack, actually. Um, so next up, I wanna talk about the third segmentation application we've worked on, which is multi-random network aggregation. And often in scientific imaging, there's a lack of training data. Uh, when you have a lack of training data or ground truth labels, um, you're, you're really worried about overfitting, your network's overfitting. So you really require lean networks that don't easily overfit. And our answer here was ensembles of random neural networks, each with tunable complexity. On the right side, let me play this video one more time, on the right side, uh, you see in blue and red um, some of the sparse labeling we accomplished, um, the fibers of these tomography of concrete fibers, uh, fibers in blue, um, surrounding areas in the in internals of fibers in blue, uh, the fibers in red or brown, both the XY plane on the top two, and then you see the orthogonal view if you're looking directly into these fibers on the bottom. And we took many lean tunable networks, um, each with several thousand parameters. I mean, your typical unit's got millions, tens of millions. ChatGPT is 70 billion parameters, but uh, 
We look at many of these lean networks ensembling for stability and variance estimation, and we perform uncertainty quantification uh, via conformal predictions. And Delcia really helped us provide a variety of architectures that can be tested for really a number of problems here, right? Um, whether using the tunable units, whether using MST nets, uh, we offer user friendly wrappers, and it works for our tutorials and notebooks. You'll see a couple, I think, examples. Uh, time permitting, but we're implementing some of these network aggregations into some of the training scripts in Delcia. But um, what you will see in the tutorial section is uh, a walkthrough of our image classification task, where we look to ensemble for image classification as well. This is not pixel by pixel um, predictions. This is is this a square? Is this a circle? Is this a triangle or image? We once again employ an ensemble of networks. Um, they served as an easy regularization technique. The ensembling was an easy regularization technique to improve the performance of just a single network classifier, a single network to classify. Uh, we use a stochastic network generator to build a variety of convolutional neural networks, um, each of them yielding an independent classifier. And we didn't do anything fancy. We just averaged each network outcome. We average all the outcomes together. And we're really happy with the benchmark case. Um, on the top middle, you see each of the individual network performances, the F1 scores. So um, I don't know why a few are missing, but oh, oh, sorry. I, you see the occurrences on the Y axis. Um, some networks did poorly, some did better approaching 0.7, some very poor, <laughs> F1 score of one half. Um, when we ensemble all these networks, we get an ensemble of 94, 0.94, a, a really, really, really impressive improvement. And again, you see not just this network thinks it's a circle, this network thinks it's a triangle, you get the class probabilities and the, and the, um, the confidence that this image is a circle as opposed to a rectangle in the class probability diagrams in the bottom right. Um, I think I need to maybe speed things up. Um, I don't want to get too, I want to talk about the next project, uh, the second to last one. Uh, we looked at further compressions of autoencoder latent spaces, um, autoencoders in fluctuation scattering, X-ray scattering data. We wanted to aim for fast and reliable outlayer, outlier detection. So we're inspired by autoencoders, um, usually maps input to a compressed representation. You see the blue in the very middle and the bottom, this latent space representation, the autoencoder. Uh, we'll typically take your N by M image and represent it as some um, vector of length X, where X is 100, 200 variables. It's a much, it's a very compressed latent, compressed representation. We took this latent space, we further projected we further compressed into two dimensional latent space. So each of these tiny blue dots in our 2D projection is one of the original images. Um, we visualize this, uh, we visualize and sort of average out and smooth out the average looking image in each of these faces. And it really helps us pick out the decent, questionable, and the and the bad. What happened with these with these scattering images? Um, again, once um, your network's trained, we can just pass a stack of images really quickly and, and get some really good insight in where and why um, outliers are occurring. And the last project before I conclude here is the inpainting of detector gaps. Um, this project was actually spearheaded by um, Alex Exmer and Tani Chavez um, was a leading author here. Um, Tani, you're awesome. For many X-ray scattering experiments, detector gaps can introduce discontinuities. See on the top right, we have the input width gaps. Um, that's when the detector is sort of moved down and you, it's no way to recover this information because in many cases, at least with the horizontal gaps, there is no information. What we do is we employ a two-dimensional unit to recover. Well, we don't really recover the missing data the in-painting process will estimate the missing data, um, particularly with the vertical gaps. Um, and we see the output, uh, the in-painted images once passed through a unit. Um, you see a close-up of the horizontal gap paintings and the vertical gap paintings in the bottom left. 
uh, we're really happy with this. Um, I think it was a really, really neat experiment. Uh, we got it out in IUCR just last year. Um, yeah, it made it really cool. It's really popular kind of pop sci, pop. I, I say science, you have scientific machine learning. You've also got the sort of <laughs> big machine learning that all the, the big tech companies are doing and in painting where they scratch out the faces and they diffusion models or neural networks will like create a face from nothing. Um, they kind of got a little popular a couple of years ago. Uh, here's a couple just sort of let's have fun. Let's kind of look at some of the, the gaps that we filled. Uh, you can see some of the zoomed in portions and gap portions in blue and green. Um, we, we do a, we're really happy of the work here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, like on the blue, on the bottom blue, right? Um, it's, it's pretty believable <laughs> in painting over this, uh, some of these, these peaks and the continuation of the bottom portion of the ring um, in the bottom of the blue. Um, it looks pretty believable. Um, so to wrap it up, what's next for the Zwart Lab? We're always interested in, in loading up really new cutting edge and useful neural networks into Delcia, um, do the heavy lifting for you and let you just choose the hyperparameters. We've recently implemented UNet3+, which uh, it's a modification that, it's, it's a UNet, but the modification is it combines features at all length scales via dense skip connections. Density is uh, a little important today, kind of harkening back to the mixed scale dense networks. We saw the advantages there and the UNet3 plus might be the best of both worlds. Um, we have a lot of toggling and fiddling and optimizing of the code, but we've got something that runs and we're really excited to get another um, really cool tunable network out to the masses. From an R&D perspective, we're looking at further looking at robust prediction estimates using ensembling of methods. And the next application on the horizon is this chromatin and filament segmentation of voluminous uh, cryo-electron data. Uh, once again, with the um, furthering work with the Colorado application with the lab here. Um, so to wrap things up, I think I'm at 30 minutes. Sorry, went a little over. Um, acknowledge funding from LBNL, LERD, and camera on the left. Um, Contacts for myself and for Peter, um, uh, staff scientist at LBL, my PI, are here. Um, websites to GitHub, read the docs. You can find um, pretty robust amount of tutorials, starting with some basic introduction ones down to the more um, involved image classification ensembling ones and the tutorials in the read the docs section. Um, particular thanks to my employee of the month, Beowulf, and Peter's employee of the month, Aria, and Thanks everyone so much for your time. Um, I'll link these in the chat and any of this sounds any at all interesting. Um, I love to hear from anyone and everyone and let's collaborate away. Uh, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Eric. That was absolutely fantastic. I would love to just take a few moments to address any questions that maybe our panelists had. Uh, Dan and Tani, or anyone in our audience, if you have a question for Eric, please enter it in the Q&A panel or the chat. We'll make sure that we get to it. Um, yeah, I think that actually uh, that was a really great talk, Eric. I thought that that was a great uh, summary of uh, all the possibilities and capabilities that currently Dell CL offers. Um, I do, I think, have a follow-up question, and I think that goes back a little bit on your slides as well. Um, so when we were chatting about latent space exploration, and I think that that's, uh, that, that's actually quite wonderful, um, you did have on your slide a visualization tool to see kind of like how uh, the latent space relates to kind of like what the data actually represents so that you can see, for example, the location of the data that is related to, the, to those latent vectors and how they are distributed among the latent space. Is that visualization tool also part of the LCIA? And if so, how can it help users to better understand kind of like this latent space exploration process? Oh, great question, Tani. Um, can I share my screen again just to, just to have it up to look at? Of course. Which one do I'm looking for the correct window? Here's the one. Okay. Um, so the visualization tool is not in Delcia yet. Um, that's that's something I should I should get in there. Um, that's something I should be 
um, getting out to any users who would want to fiddle with the, the latent space um, compression stuff. Um, I think the second part of that question, uh, I think you asked how does it help visualize, represent, or pick out any erroneous images here, Danny? Was that the question? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, I mean, first and foremost, um, the, the, the UMAP mapping can be a little subjective, quite a bit subjective, actually. Um, I know it's gained quite a bit of popularity, but fair warning, it's, it's a, it is a sort of subjective um, representation. But for data that you do pass through, data that you do train on, um, uh, we, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good, I think it's a good way to just see where the data lies in relation to other data. Right? You're going to be grouping um, like images together, uh, and you're going to maybe see some different separations of different classes or different shapes or different geometries that you didn't think you had. Um, so I think it's a, going to be a really valuable tool, potentially, for a lot of exploration, uh, data exploration as well, not just outlier detection. Hope I kind of answered um, everything you had, Danny. Uh, no, yeah, I think so. I think it's also, for example, like as a user of uh, the Delcia um, software framework, um, I think that uh, we have used this in the past, uh, in particular, to see um, kind of like what the distribution of our data will be and kind of like to identify or have an idea uh, if this latent space will be suitable to uh, cluster regions of interest as well and to see kind of like how separated they, these clusters are from each other. So I think that um, kind of like as a user, and especially uh, if I'm just, for example, running different algorithms or different uh, architectures for these autoencoders, I can compare them not only in terms of like uh, just like a numerical loss in this case, but also just by visualizing and seeing like how my data is distribution, distributed along this uh, latent space. So I think that that's actually uh, pretty cool as well. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I think that that is a great question. Oh, no, yeah, thanks for the question and the input. Yeah, you're totally right. Um, yeah, a little, uh, a little um, qualitative, but yeah, just having a visualization tool there um, without having to dip, in, dip into any um, higher level mathematics is, is, I think, really helpful and generalizable. A lot of tools, a lot of people. I have sort of a philosophical question with a little bit of a wind up. I, I was reminded of a talk that Yana Thayer from LCLS gave years and years ago about how they have to do significant lossy compression on their data because the rates are just so high. And there's some concern that journals would not accept submissions that have that lossy compression because it's not really the data. But of mm -hmm. course, some kind of transformations happen in the detector in the first place. So it's just a question of you know, what, what is too far. And thinking about the, the in-painting work, I do wonder at, at what point you worry that that's you know, fabricating something that's not physical. How do you think about that philosophically? <laughs> that's a, philosophically, that's that's a great question. I mean, what what is the latent space really? Um, I think of it as really sort of an energy space, an information space, maybe an information theory background. Um, mm -hmm. I there there's I, I touch on a lot of qualitative things in this slide in this project particularly with UMAP, particularly with just viewing the data. We haven't really applied anything like a k-means clustering. So that could be a first step towards sort of formalizing and getting some quantitative statistics, getting some quantitative measures here um, to sort of peer into decisively what is different, what is an outlier. Um, in terms of what is too lossy, what is not, that's, that's, that's such a hard question to sort of or even ponder really, right? A um, lossy compression, I guess, is choosing what is safe to remove, and in-painting is choosing what is safe to add. And in the eye of the beholder, those might be very different things. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we, we had a reviewer too, of course, in the in-painting paper um, say, well, th this, this isn't real. Um, how is this going to affect downstream tasks? Um, and those, that was a very real and very, I think, important thing to bring up. Um, yeah, we didn't advertise the in-painting as this is the thing to do. Um, 
but we wanted to highlight that there's a lot of things it could help with if we want to do any any sort of future latent space um, analysis or compression techniques. The inpainting, I think we showed it, it can go a long way um, in in helping some of these compression um, techniques. So sort of piggyback one project off the other. Um, yeah, those are very real concerns. And oh, sorry, I. Oh, no, no, actually, no, like, I, I was also going to uh, chime in uh, with another comment, but once you're, you're completely done with your comment, of course. That's it. I'm good. Go for it. Thanks. Yeah, no, I was actually going to chime in as well on that thought uh, about the imprinting work in particular, because uh, in this case, we were looking at the problem kind of from a machine learning uh, processing perspective. And unfortunately, those gaps are usually seen as features that machine learning algorithms pick as very important because they show up in every single image. Uh, so for that reason, we were exploring those. Um, and yeah, as Eric mentioned before, I think at the very end of the paper, we did uh, show that at the end of the day, when it comes at least to latent space exploration, which is like the most uh, relevant or uh, more critical representation of data in terms of a machine learning realm, um, it does help quite a bit to have those filled in uh, just because the algorithms will be able to pick uh, or to understand better the nature of the data, but it's not unnecessary for like other, for example, physics-based uh, data, data analysis processing of X-ray scattering uh, images. So kind of like throw that in there. Um. Yeah, thanks so much, Tani. I think that was some fantastic insight there. Before we wrap up, I do wanna make sure that we have time for the two questions that our audience has asked us. And I want to start with the question concerning packaging in Python. So Eric or any of our panelists, how would you go about packaging your Python tools for end users, especially when their purpose is to create visualizations? How would we, what, what's, what's the meaning of, of packaging here? I mean, we're working on a pip installing, pip installer package, but I'm assuming you mean something different. I'd assume pip installable package, how would you go about distributing something like this to end users? Do you just make it globally available on pip or do you have your own kind of uh, private pip repository for you and your collaborators? Oh, oh, great, 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 great. Um, we, I thought we had a working pip. Um, <laughs> we had to scratch that uh, for further development. I think I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've got everything um, documented on the GitHub and um, particularly on the read the docs, we would be pointing users to the read the docs, um, particularly there um, in lieu of a pip install yet. And the read the docs gives, um, I think some pretty pretty succinct um, instructions on how to install, install from source, run a pip installee, start a new environment, kind of walk you through all of that. Um, instructions for how to download the tutorials uh, themselves. Um, by themselves really. Um, but to get this out to the masses, we're really pointing people to the read the docs page, which let me just, uh, let me just put it in the chat for now. So I really wish we had a pip install for everyone to see, for everyone to use, uh, but that's that's coming soon. I think definitely by the middle of April. Mm -hmm. And I think for in terms of visualization, I there's there's some visualization things we, we can improve on. We have all the normal bells and whistles with your loss functions. You can you can show in real time per epoch um, what's your convergence like. Are you converging? Um, but in terms of visualizations, um, yeah, we there things are going to be so specific with each problem, right? But yeah, yeah visualization is something that we we it's kind of been on my mind for quite some time. Some sort of visualizing tactics, just visualize your output data. Multi, multi cell window. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think uh, some of the, the issues, you know, is not related to any package or tool specifically, but I would probably point at Python itself. There's not really great guidelines about how to go about packaging and distributing your projects. And I think some of that issue stems from everything that you install in Python by default, right? installs under a global namespace or your user namespace. 
we don't really have this idea of project specific namespaces for Python installs unless you start using a virtual environment manager or you're doing everything in a Docker container. But both of those, as pointed out in the chat, are very are high level tasks that aren't easy or uh, graspable for individuals who might not be com uh, comfortable with computers. And so it's very hard to distribute Python binaries or things like that, where it's just a one click download and then you're just good to go. And then Eric, you had a comment? I, I do, yeah. Um, thanks to everyone in the chat that kind of cleared things up on what we kind of mean by packaging. Yeah, we put a lot of time and care into setting up um, the required and requisite um, packages and submodules and requirements. So our, our, our main philosophy is just make it easy, right? So once you go through and either pip install or uh, follow the instructions on read the docs and install from source. Um, you should just be good to go to import um, any Delcia submodule um, once you have it in your environment or package downloaded. Yeah, we set up a lot of time to make things up to date and kind of foolproof it for all the requirements um, needed. So. Awesome. Thank you for all that extra work. I know creating your project is one thing, and but then making sure it can get into the end user's hand is a totally different task. So I appreciate the efforts that you and your team members have put into that. The last question that I want to bring up today has to do specifically with uh, using the DLSA. Um, so we have a question about, can we use your uh, any of your models for things like counting spots in an X-ray scattering images? And has it been used to do that before? We can certainly, we can certainly, um, oh yeah. For sure, has been used specifically to count spots in X-ray scattering data. Not not specifically. I think we did a we've done a few harder projects with a team at LBL, uh, particularly with looking at um, different artifacts and different um, spot and tear like sort of aberrations in some of these scattering images, and we're looking to detect them so for for masking later on down the line. Um, they're able to do something similar to spot counting, spot masking, spot detecting, and two things. If you have ground truth data that label the spots, yeah, our neural networks can be trained to detect the spots given the ground truth data, classic supervised learning. And then of course, once they're detected, just use, you can use watershedding techniques, you can use a lot of methods to, to count once they're segmented. Um, if you don't have the ground truth data and you want to detect the spots just on their own, no ground truth data, no knowledge of, of where the spots are, yeah, we've been looking at some of the unsupervised techniques, um, not just ensembling methods, but we've been using some of these mixed scale dense net and sparse mixed scale dense net ideas to discover um, for, for segmentation discovery. Um, so yeah. We, we can, it's, it's definitely a feasible project with and without ground truth data. I'm more interested if you don't have ground truth data, because that's an excuse to keep looking at some of the cool unsupervised exploratory uh, discovery. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. That's, that's really exciting. I'm uh, brain tickled, I'm using <laughs> my words and my voice. Definitely. And I do want to say before we wrap up that if you are signed up for our DOEPY mailing list, which you can find on our website, we will be distributing the videos, slides, and even the contact deal details for our guest panelist, Eric, here. So if you are interested in a collaboration or want to say, Eric, I struggle doing this task. Can you help me out? Do you have any models that do this? This is a fantastic opportunity for you all. But that does bring us a little bit past the time that we have allotted for today. And I do have to say that this has been an absolutely fantastic exchange. I'd love to give a huge thanks to Eric, as well as everyone in our audience who joined us this month. These exchanges would not be possible without all of you. And we're very happy that we can bring in these fantastic panelists to share how they use Python in their own work and research and how they can use Python to help you in your own work and research. Make sure that you tune in again next month. That's April 26th, always the last Wednesday of the month, where we will have 
Tally Lambert join us to talk about two projects, Magic GUI and PySignal. So if you love working on graphical user interfaces, this will be the exchange you do not want to miss. In the meantime, watch out for updates on our website. That's meetup.doepy.org. And we will see you all next time. Thanks, everyone.